Excellent. Okay, yeah. So let's talk about lawns. Uh, I'm going to talk about the lazy lawnmower, a simple way to help bees. So I, I was excited to hear that you um, had a presentation yesterday, a speaker yesterday, that talked about um, why you should care about black flies. So I think it's a little bit easier to think like, why do we care about bees? Why do we need bees? Well, think about it. If you like strawberries, then we need bees. Um, there's roughly 87% of all flowering plants require pollination services from bees. Um, from a, um, an agricultural perspective, bees perform a $56 billion per year service by pollinating um, a whole bunch of different crops. Um, so again, if we like to eat, we need bees. But as you probably know, bees are in trouble and they need us as well. Two of the, the biggest concerns that have really kind of um, been focused in the news over the last decade um, are these two um, components of agricultural intensification and habitat loss. There's a number of other factors as well, but these are kind of the, the two big ones and really what's, what drives a lot of my research. When we think about habitat loss, um, one of the biggest drivers of that is from urban development, um, urban and suburban development or, or residential development in general. And so what you can see is that you go from these more pristine types of forested landscapes that we have in New England to the suburban sprawl that I have pictured here. And so a real big driving force is habitat loss creating bee declines. But when you go from this kind of this bee's eye view from up in the sky, usually it's a bird's eye view, down to the, the ground and to the, the worm's eye view, you actually see that there's actually, in addition to habitat loss, there's also habitat gains, particularly when we look at these pollinator gardens. And I have a couple of pictures here. And so when we think about ways that people can help bees, I think for many of us, this is what comes to mind about planting these like very specific and intentional pollinator gardens. Um, but let's get, let's get back to talking a little bit more about yards. Um, and one of the things that I like to talk about is this, this publication from 1973. And so the idea of yards as serving as wildlife habitat has been around for, for almost 50 years. And so this is a publication um, by Jack Ward Thomas and, and Dick DeGraff, two Forest Service scientists, and really kind of switched the narrative about how we think about wildlife habitat and wildlife management. And this is one of the first publications to really provide a how-to guide, what to plant and what to expect. And one of the, um, and one of the, the outcomes of this, um, this product really inspired the National Wildlife Federation's Habitat Certification Program. And since then, there's been a whole bunch of other different um, certification programs from the National Audubon Society, Mass Audubon, um, a number of different extension um, programs, um, but the, the big idea is really trying to provide people what types of local plants to have, what they should do and how to do it and, and giving people access to resources. And kind of the, the two main um, recommendations that a lot of these programs are really um, throwing at people is one is to plant native plants. And two, when we think about our, our yards is to re remove or significantly reduce your lawn. All right, so I promised to talk about lawns. So let's, here we go. Lawns cover 163,800 square kilometers. So that's a lot of area, but what, what does that actually mean? So that's roughly the size of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts, that entire area. So it's a huge amount of, of green space that covers both urban, suburban, and, and rural landscapes. Um, within our cities and suburbs, it's roughly 40 to 55% of all land cover. Um, and then when we hone into an individual yard, it can be as much as 60% of a residential parcel. And so when we think about lawns, you know, a lot of times they're managed like this. And because of this monoculture, there's really not a lot going on in here. A lot of my colleagues have really dismissed and vilified lawns as being these biodiversity deserts or relatively useless for birds and bees. And I remember back at my, my PhD defense about 10 years ago, um, somebody asked me a question, what can we do to help, to help wildlife? And my number one answer was, oh, we need to get rid of our lawns. And everybody clapped, everybody thought that was a great idea. But then I started thinking about that. And I came back to this number of 163,800 square kilometers 
And I realized removing and reducing um, uh, the lawns across the United States was almost impossible. So I came up with this new mantra, how do we make lawns less bad? And I, I guess I can ex extend that lawns to these cities and suburbs and recognizing that we're not going to make them into these perfect wildlife habitats, but there's a lot of opportunities that we can remanage and rethink how we look at these spaces to really try to share them with the birds and the bees and all the other animals and critters as well. And so I started doing a lot more investigation in terms of well, what, what are lawns and you know, finding out the history of lawns and what we're doing to lawns and really focusing in again on some of these different management decisions. And I like to think of it along this temporal scale. And so we might be doing daily irrigation, weekly mowing or seasonal application of fertilizers. And some of my colleagues conducted a study of six cities across the United States um, and asking people about whether or not they're irrigating and applying fertilizer. And from that, um, from that study, what they found is that it's roughly between 50 to 80% um, of Americans that were surveyed. Um, so what this really tells us is that not everybody is irrigating, not everybody is fertilizing. But one thing that we do know is that roughly 99% of people who do have a lawn are mowing at some, some rate, and mostly they're mowing weekly. And so, so then I started thinking a little bit more, like why do we mow our lawns all the time? And so really when we think about lawns, you've got to think of it within this social lens. It's a social construct. It's really this extension of our home. And the main reason we're mowing them is to keep, you know, to keep up these appearances for the aesthetic value. And again, around 10 years ago, when the new, my newsfeed was filled with the plight of bees, it was around this time that my husband and I finally had a house where we were in charge of, of the, the yard care. And so we too felt that pressure to go out and mow the lawn. And I remember one, one year, um, it was my husband's turn to mow um, and I had gone out. And what I noticed was that he had mowed this patchwork of the lawn and left a lot of these different areas unmowed. And I thought that was a little strange. And so I went out to investigate. Um, and what I realized is that the areas that he left unmowed were patches of flowers. And we were a bit too lazy to go plant our own pollinator garden. So I thought, oh, this, this could do. This was a, another way of really having these, these pretty little flowers growing in our yard. But then when I looked down um, and investigated a little more, I saw this swirling around. And what I saw was some bumblebees buzzing around on some of the flowers that my husband had left in the, the lawn. And I just had one of those aha moments. And I thought, wait a second, what happens if we mow our lawns less? Um, do we, you know, how is that, could that affect bees? And so I designed a study that in fact tested that, that very hypothesis about mowing our lawns less frequently. And so the idea here is that if we, mow, if we mow our lawns, say every two weeks or every three weeks, would we have more lawn flowers like dandelions and clovers and, and violets like Brett was asking about earlier um, when she was doing the introduction. And if we have more lawn flowers or more habitat, then do we have more bees? And being a natural historian at heart, I was also just, just simply interested in the habitat value of these lawn dominated yards. And so, I started working um, in Springfield, Massachusetts. So um, as most of you know, this is um, the third largest city in Massachusetts. Um, and I worked in these 16 lawn dominated yards. And I'm gonna use that term probably a little bit throughout my talk. And so what that means is that there's basically, you know, um, this picture on the left really exemplified the types of yards that, that I was working in. Um, and that these were yards that had a couple of different types of plantings, but for the most part, they didn't have vegetable gardens, they didn't have pollinator plants, they didn't have anything really spectacular or special that was going that was meant to attract um, to attract bees. And then within all of these 16 yards, um, each of the yard got assigned a different mowing frequency. They're going to be mowed either every week, every two weeks, and every or every three weeks. And so to do some of these types of studies, especially experimental studies um, in people's yards is really quite challenging. And so you have to try to find that fine balance between um, you know, letting people have control over the yard, but for the same time, I also needed to have that control as well to be able to really test whether or not we mow less frequently, do we have more lawn flowers and then more bees. 
And so for the yards that participated in the study, everybody agreed not to irrigate or to fertilize over the course of the study. And you know, fortunately, the, the yards that signed up for this program, they weren't doing that anyway. So, so that was a pretty easy ask. But the bigger ask was making sure that um, the 16 yards that were participating did not mow their lawns outside of those um, either every week, every two weeks, or every three weeks, what I had assigned them um, in terms of their lawn mowing frequency. So in order to control that, because that was the main question, uh, we mowed all of the lawns for free over a course of two years. And so that was um, a really great way of trying to recruit people to the study. Um, and then it just as a, a little fun fact, over the two years of mowing 16 lawns, either every week, every two weeks, every three weeks, was the equivalent of us walking from, or pushing, actually, let's say pushing the lawnmower from Springfield down to Philadelphia and back again. Um, and I have pictured here in the top left corner, one of the yards that was mowed every week um, over the course of two years. And I think we clocked in about 75 miles, just going back and forth. And this yard is not too big. I think it's about a quarter of an acre. Um, and so when we think about lawn mowing um, in terms of some of the, the, the ecosystem services that you might they might provide. So if you are doing the mowing and you're actually pushing a mower, you might be getting some exercise. So anyways, let's go back to, to the science in terms of um, how it, what I was looking at. So at each yard, before we mowed, um, either every week, every two weeks, or every three weeks, um, we looked at the total lawn flower abundance, like how many of these different lawn flowers were present, and also accounted for a whole bunch of other factors, other types of flowers that might be around, um, and then went in and, and counted the number of bees. And we did this a couple of different ways by trapping them in these small little bowls or running around the yards with, um, with these bee nets, with um, and so that was always fun too, because we had a chance of, of telling people what we were doing because they were like always asking because we had these, these nets in our, our hands and um, mowing these lawns pretty frequently. And so what we found um, in terms of the floral diversity, the different types of lawn flowers, um, we identified 58 different species that were growing in, in just these 16 lawns. So these are these spontaneous plants. Some people might call them weeds. Um, and I have here listed on the left some of the top 10 most abundant. Um, the bottom left-hand corner is a, a pie chart of where they're located from. And kind of the take-home message here is that, you know, about a third of the flowers that we identified are native to North America. So when we step back a little bit and think about um, biodiversity loss and, you know, what's going on in our, our yards, like, are they, are they actually these biological deserts? Maybe not so much. Um, you know, again, I was, I was pretty astonished that we were able to identify this number. And this actually tracks with some other studies that have also been looking at the different types of lawn flowers in yards in other cities and suburbs as well. And so I think, um, you know, in terms of that natural history component, what I think this is really demonstrating is that, you know, I think at first we look at these lawns and you think, oh, it's, it's just grass. But then you actually get down on your hands and knees and start looking and realizing there's a lot more growing than we actually thought. And these are all seeds that were already part of the seed bank. So nothing that was, was planted at all. In terms of um, the hypothesis that I was testing, do you, if you mow less frequently, do you have more lawn flowers? And the simple answer is yes. And so the yards that were mowed every three weeks had roughly 70% more yard, uh, sorry, lawn flowers than those that were mowed every week or every two weeks. So this was really cool. So I was able to kind of check that box that, um, and also kind of a, um, it was it's very expected. So you figure if you mow your lawn less frequently, there's going to be more lawn flowers, but it's always nice to um, confirm some of your observations. Okay, so what did we find about the bees? So this also really exceeded my expectations. Again, you know, let me put on my natural history hat, my natural historian hat first. So we identified 111 different species of bee. Again, I have a picture of the yard, the typical yards that we were working in, 16 lawn dominated yards in Springfield, Massachusetts. So to put this number into perspective, this represented roughly 25% of the state list of bees. So the total number of, of bee species that have been recorded in Massachusetts. So I just want you to just think about that for a second. So, you know, again, Massachusetts is a pretty well collected state. It's pretty diverse when we think about the different types of, of ecotones and um, different types of habitats. Um, and that when we're focusing in on one small part of the state in one type of habitat, 
to be able to document 25% of all species, I think is pretty extraordinary. Uh, we identified, you know, roughly 35 species per yard. So again, that's, you know, these super high numbers, um, you know, probably if you were to go out and, and do bird point counts and to document which bird species you would see, might not get that same number for, um, for these different yards. And then the, the picture I have on the right hand side um, is one of our, our most abundant bees that we identified throughout the study, the Lazioglossum ilioense. And so this drab looking bee, yes, it's not exciting at all. It's about the size of a grain of rice. Um, but what was really interesting and exciting about this, um, this species is that, um, as I mentioned, it was the most abundant bee that we collected, but also the last time Lazioglossum ilioense was um, documented and collected in Massachusetts was back in the 1920s. And it was only represented by two individuals in the eastern part of the state, outside, just right outside of Boston. And so this, this was really exciting, um, even though it's a really common bee further south. And so we did some genetic work to see if there was something interesting going on. Um, there wasn't. And I think what we were able to document is this northward movement of this, um, of this species. Uh, but again, I think it just, again, really demonstrates that when you start looking, you never know what you're going to find. So a little, a little bit more about the natural history, the types of bees, the different types of traits that we had. So most of the bees that we um, collected were native to North America. So again, when we think about um, biodiversity in our cities and suburbs, bees are doing pretty well. Um, I have some other kind of like for any people that are out there, kind of bee fanatics, um, most of them are from the family Helictidiaes. Um, most of these bees are nesting in the soil and the ground. And then most of these bees are polylectic. So that's a fancy way of saying that these are generalist species. So they don't require a very specific type of, of plant, a very spe um, species or family of plants um, for, for gathering its nectar and, and pollen. Um, again, pie charts are, are kind of cool, but what I'd really like for you to do is just take a moment and just enjoy some of the diversity uh, of bees that we, um, that we are finding in our backyards. And so you have an hour or two to spare. I highly recommend going on to Sam Drogi's, um, his um, photographic page. Uh, if you just, I think if you just Google Sam Drogi USGS, he has these amazing photographs um, of bees from across the United States and, and probably um, other parts of the world as well. But I just want you to just to enjoy the, um, the diversity, the color, um, their ability to collect pollen, like their hairiness, uh, their, I, I, again, like the, the green metallic bees on the top left. Um, and, you know, who doesn't love bumblebees? I just still think they're absolute cutest little creatures ever. So again, you know, again, really trying to celebrate the, the bees in our backyard. But going back to the hypothesis that, um, that I was asking and that we're really interested, like, do you mow your, if you mow your lawns less, now we know on the left-hand side with that um, figure that uh, we do have more flowers, um, but what does that mean in terms of bees? And so if you look at the figure on the right, the top right corner, um, I have the lawn mowing frequency on the, the bottom axis, on the x-axis, and then the total number of bees collected on the y-axis. And what we found is that there was a really strong relationship between the number of flowers and the, um, the number of bees. And so kind of the, the take home message here is that the yards that were mowed every two weeks had the most, um, the most bees in them. So when we think about, um, what's going on in terms of pollination, um, what might be actually a little bit more important, we still don't know, um, is that it could be more the, the number of bees that are present, not necessarily which types of bees that are present. And so this idea of these workhorse species that might be doing the majority of the pollination. Um, one of the, so, so yes, we were able to, you know, to confirm what, what we set out to, to test, um, but it didn't follow exactly the, the pattern that I expected. So, you know, just to, to remind everybody that um, what, when I set out this study that I thought if we mow our lawns less, we're going to have more flowers. And if we have more flowers, we're going to have more bees. And so you see that up until the two weeks, um, but the three week yards had more flowers, but they didn't have more bees. And so I started thinking about that a little bit more about, well, what's actually going on here? And, and one thought that we have is that, so although the yards that are mowed every three weeks have more flowers, um, they also have taller grass. 
And so as a reminder, most of the bees that we collected are about the size of a grain of rice. So they're, they're pretty small. So in addition to having more flowers, you're also having taller grass. And so what we're thinking that might be happening is that the grass might make it a little bit too difficult for some of these smaller bees to navigate through to get at the, the resources that they need. And so therefore might not be using these yards that have more flowers because of the taller grass. Um, that definitely needs some more some more research and you know hopefully i'll be able to address that in the future um but i, I want to take a little bit of a detour here and and talk about a couple of other components of this study um again like framing this more in terms of the ecosystem services that lawn mowing can provide and so when we go back to this this idea about when we mow less two things that i want to mention about um in other parts of the study is that are there unintended consequences in terms of increased health risks and or are there additional benefits when we think about decreased carbon emissions from the actual lawnmower itself? And so I wanna talk a little bit about ticks um, because this was a question that was raised almost immediately every time I started telling people about the study when I started figuring out where I was going to do it and doing all the, the research planning, everybody kept saying to me, what about the ticks? If you don't mow your lawn and you have really tall grass, you're going to have ticks. Um, and this is a serious concern, as you know, folks, you all know um, here in Massachusetts as well as in New Hampshire. Um, but in, in Massachusetts, Lyme disease, there are 30,000 cases between 2016, sorry, 2006 and 2015. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, I wanted to test whether or not there was going to be some of these consequences of mowing less frequently in terms of having more abundance of ticks. And so similar to the hypotheses that I tested for the lawn flowers and bees, it followed a similar um, pattern where if we mow our lawns less frequently, do we have more ticks? And the way you do that is by using um, a, a cloth, uh, by dragging it across the, the lawns and the ticks will just grab onto the, um, to the cloth and that's a way, and because they're, you know, most of them are, are much darker than the, the color of the cloth, it's really easy to, um, to be able to count and to, to really track them. And so um, I conducted these, these tick drags the same time that we were doing our, um, our, our bee collections um, at the same, the same time right before we were mowing the lawn so that we got at that maximum height right before mowing at those three lawn mowing frequencies and also made sure that I was um, conducting this study during the time when ticks are really most active. So from May to September, again, mimicking when we we're collecting um, all of the other data. So here's an um, opportunity for everybody just to, um, to get involved in this presentation. I want everybody just to think, how many ticks do you think we, we collected over the course of the two years? And if you would like to just put your answers in the chat and Brett, if you can just give me some of the numbers as they start um, getting um, sent through. Okay, the first guess is 10,000. Anyone else have a guess? So you're asking for the over the course of the study as yes. opposed to in a single? Over the course of the study, how many ticks did we collect? There are thousands, quite thousands. I'm gonna guess while we're waiting. Okay, we got 5,000, 3,300. That's very precise. 500,000, half a million is a guess, 1,000. So we've got so far a range from 1,000 to half a million. All right, so here's the answer. None. We collected zero, zero, zero ticks. So remember, this is in Springfield, Massachusetts. There are ticks everywhere around. However, it depends on where. Um, and so this was also good because I got to let everybody know when I said, oh, we were mowing our lawns less frequently. And when people are, oh, but the ticks, I said, oh, but we didn't have any ticks. Um, but it's really hard to do anything with zero, with no data. And so I, I shelved these data for a while. Um, I published the other research about the bees um, in other, other journals. And then in 2018, I was flipping through consumer reports issue. Um, and I came across an article about tick proofing your yard without spraying. And I thought, oh, this is really cool. And then I looked carefully and I saw that their number one recommendation is to um, not let your grass height exceed four to four and a half inches. And so I've done the math for you here. 
um, and what I have the um, the the different um, grass heights below the different weekly treatments, just to give you an idea, because that was the other thing that we did measure is the, the grass height over the course of the season. Um, and so what you'll, you'll see is that Consumer Reports is recommending that we mow our lawns to keep them pretty much in line with that one week frequency. And so this, this kind of upset me a little bit because if we're mowing our lawns every week, um, first of all, what we found in Springfield, Massachusetts in these suburban types of yards um, that there weren't any ticks in the lawns. Um, but what we are finding is that if you mow your lawn less frequently and have taller grass, you're gonna have a lot more bees. And so they're contradicting each other. So one, you're, you're trying to protect yourself from ticks, but it's gonna have these negative consequences for bees. Um, and so we put together um, a publication ab about this study and really wanted to put this within context um, because the context really does matter. And so, you know, having lived in, in Keene, New Hampshire and, and spending a lot of time in, in central southern New Hampshire, I, I know a lot of these um, different areas in the area. And so like the, the yard on the left, like to me, that's an area where it's like really tick central. Um, and so, but what's happening though, is that for the most part, the ticks are not hanging out so much in your lawn, but they're hanging out on the stone wall or in the forest or the scraggly edges around your yard. Um, whereas the yard that I have pictured on the right, um, and this is a, an image from Springfield, um, is that these yards are surrounded by other yards and there's not that much forest around. There's not these larger forest patches. Um, and so this research, you know, looking at ticks in yards has been replicated in other areas of really high tick and high Lyme disease areas and have also found the similar things. Yes, ticks are present, but they're not hanging out in our lawns. And so when we think about these recommendations that some of these organizations are providing, we want to make sure that they're accurate and that they're backed by science. Um, and then also making sure that we acknowledge some of the limitations of the studies at hand as well. Um, and so I'm still waiting to, to see um, Consumer Reports retract some of their recommendations. Hopefully that might happen in, in the future um, as this study gets, gets a little bit more um, out there, more public, um, publicity. When we think about um, reducing carbon emissions, this is also a really important component. Um, so I have some, some figures up here in terms of reducing carbon dioxide emissions. And so um, in general, when we think about the fossil fuel, 70% um, of global fossil fuels are located, are being emitted in cities, it, it should be cities and suburbs. Um, but in terms of where carbon is stored in our cities and suburbs, it's mostly happening in our soil. So a lot of times when we think about carbon storage, we think about trees, which is the really important. Um, but in terms of storage, it's really what's going on is what's happening underground in these soils. And so we wanted to see, again, what was going on with, the, with lawn mowing and does that have any influence in terms of some of the carbon storage that's going on in our soils? And the way we can measure that is by measuring soil respiration. And this was a, um, a really fun component of the project that I, I um, conducted with Alex Contasta, another Antioch University grad. Um, she's now um, a, a research professor at the University of New Hampshire. And so what we were able to do is again, having a similar hypothesis of, of this idea that, well, if you mow your lawn less frequently, you're gonna have taller grass. And if you have taller grass, you think it's going to be moister and cooler. And so moisture and, and the temperature are kind of these two main components um, that's really driving whether or not the soils are gonna be able to um, really store a lot of the carbon. Um, and the other thing is that for a lot of eco landscaping companies, a lot of times they're, they're recommending having taller grasses um, and purporting that it's really going to have more moister um, soils um, and cooler soils as well. So again, we wanted to test that to see what was going on. Um, but I think the kind of the more obvious thing to me anyways, when I went into the study thinking about carbon emissions was really looking at the carbon emissions from the actual lawnmower. Um, and so again, like thinking about the, the carbon dioxide from the, um, from the motor. And so again, testing this, this hypothesis, again, you mow your lawn less frequently, you're going to emit less carbon dioxide. And so what we found was that, again, looking at these um, two different ways of, of, of mowing, 
um, the different lawn mowing frequency. Um, the way to read this figure here, again, I have the different weeks on the bottom and then the, um, the y axis. So don't get scared about like, you know, the carbon dioxide flux, the grams per carbon per, um, per year, per season. Um, the take home message here is that basically we didn't find any difference in the amount of respiration rates um, across the three different uh, mowing treatments. So in other words, the yards that were mowed every three weeks, the, the grasses and the soils weren't any moister or any cooler than the yards that were mowed every week. Um, so this was, this was kind of interesting. Again, going back to this, a lot of these recommendations that if you have taller grasses, you're gonna have moister soils. Um, so in the case in Springfield, Massachusetts, this was not happening. Um, but what we found um, a really strong difference, and this goes, um, you know, similar to what we expected, what we found with the mowing less frequently and the number of lawn flowers, is that when we mowed less frequently, we emitted less carbon dioxide. So that was, you know, also very much expected because you're mowing um, less amount of time. So the, the motor is going less frequently, we're using less gasoline. Um, and these were all ways that um, all the different types of variables that went into our calculations to figure out how much carbon was being emitted. But what I really want you to, to focus on is the, um, the, scale that of, the scale that we have here on the y-axis. Um, and so you'll notice that the, the bottom part that's looking at the, um, the carbon emissions from the lawnmower, um, the y-axis just goes from zero to 36. Whereas when we're looking at the, the carbon that's being emitted from the soils, um, it starts at 300 to, to 600. So in terms of the, the amount of carbon storage, so as I remember, if you remember earlier in terms of, you know, where is all the carbon being stored? It's in the soils. And so, um, so mowing less frequently, is a good idea when we think about reducing carbon emissions, but compared to what's actually going on in the soils, it's really a drop in the bucket. Um, what's really the most important thing, if we wanna think about reducing carbon emissions in our, our lawn dominated landscapes, what we found um, is that the, the biggest thing to do is to plant more trees because it's really trees that are gonna cool the soil. They're gonna make these soils a little bit more moister and that's what's going to really be driving this reduction in, in carbon emissions. So these tree planting efforts are really super important, um, but it's lawn mowing, um, mowing your lawn less frequently when we're thinking about just these benefits for carbon emissions. Um, again, every little bit counts, but it might not be having as much of an impact as if we were going to be um, planting more trees. All right, let's go back to this question. Are these lawn dominated yards, are they biological deserts? So if it were up to me, I wish that all of our yards looked more like this picture on the right. Um, however, I know that this isn't for everybody. It takes a green thumb, it takes some time, and sometimes it takes a lot of money to have that initial planting of you know, ripping up your lawn and, and buying all the different plants to, to replace the, um, the different types of vegetation. Um, and also for some people, it might not be attractive for them or for their neighbors. And so in addition to those types of gardens of planting, intentionally planting pollinator gardens, what, what my research is really suggesting is that there's another alternative. Um, there's other ways that households can contribute to bee conservation by mowing their lawns less frequently. And so we like to call this the lazy lawnmower approach. And so I think for a lot of us, I know for me, I'm, I'm constantly being told, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. And sometimes it just, it, it feels a little overwhelming. And so what we're trying to let people know that in addition to doing all that, you can also do nothing. And I know for me, that resonates a lot. And, and I've got to tell you that this is, you know, of all the research that I've conducted, this is the only one that people come up to me and thank me for, because it gives them, or their partner um, a, a, a license to not mow their lawn or an excuse not to mow their lawn and an excuse to tell their, their neighbor why they're not mowing their lawns because they're trying to help the bees. Um, and so I think that can be a, a really powerful message, again, to let people know that they don't have to do something that they can do less and also be contributing to bee conservation. Throughout this study, um, you know, again, what I mentioned earlier that I learned a lot about lawns, the history of lawns, what people are doing in their lawns. And I also learned a lot about the people who manage their lawns, these lawn people. Um, and so what I started to realize is that there's 
like, and this is very, I'm simplifying the world according to me, um, and simplifying it into like, there's three main types of, of lawn people. There's those that want to have the perfect landscaped lawn, perfectly manicured. You can start golfing there right away. Every little grass piece is in place. There's not a single weed in sight. So there's, there's those types of lawn people. And then there's the other folks that are just like, ah, whatever, I have this lawn. I don't really know what to do. I'll mow it when I have to. Um, but you know, to me, this looks kind of nice having the, the different flowers that are, are popping up everywhere. Um, and then there's the folks in the middle that don't really know what to do. They're, they have this lawn, they see their neighbor to the, you know, the guy on the left and, and they're out there mowing, you know, a couple times a week and they're, you know, applying all sorts of fertilizers and irrigating every day. And they're thinking, well, maybe I'm supposed to do that too. Or are they looking at their other neighbor to the right and seeing, oh, well, maybe they're not mowing. So maybe I don't have to mow. So it's, it's really acknowledging all of these social pressures that we're under. Um, and that for a lot of people, we're mowing our lawns because of our neighbors and because of these neighbor, neighborly expectations. And so when I think about um, these different types of lawn people, um, I think that the, the two people in the middle and on the right hand side, so this research is really for them. So the folks on the right for them, again, this is really giving them that license to, you know, to be like, to be validated that what they're doing is, is good and it's helping the bees. And it's also giving folks in the middle that, you know, again, don't, haven't really thought about it, um, another option for, for mowing their lawns and how to care for them um, and really kind of seeing this other opportunity. Um, the other thing that I, I also want to talk about um, in terms of, so I talked about, you know, really trying to figure out, well, why didn't, like from an ecological standpoint, why didn't we see more bees, higher bee abundance in the yards that had more lawn flowers in the three-week yards? But I also, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the social implications. And so one of the things that was, um, that was really fascinating about this study was that, so we got to know the households where we were conducting the, the lawn mowing because, you know, especially the yards that were mowed every week, we were there every week. So they would come out and greet us and, you know, offer, offer us like drinks and, and snacks and everything. And, you know, we just kind of became part of their family. Um, the yards that were mowed, uh, and also the other thing that I noticed is that when we'd get to these yards every week, we would look at the grass and think, do they really need it? Um, it just didn't really seem like the lawn was tall enough. I mean, we still were able to remove some, some grass every time we mowed, um, but it, it didn't really feel like it needed it. But again, recognizing that for a lot of people that either have a lawn care company or they're mowing themselves, they, they pretty much will do it on that weekly basis. So every Saturday they're out mowing their lawn. Um, but we wanted to keep with the study. And so even though we didn't really feel like they needed it, they still got mowed every week. The yards that were mowed every two weeks, um, every time we got to them, they were like, well, they're looking a little messy, but not too bad. And you know, that really nice sense of satisfaction after we mowed. Um, and the folks in those yards, they, they seemed happy enough. The yards that were assigned to the three week mowing, however, was a different story. So before we could even get out of the car, they ran down to greet us. They were so happy that we were there. Um, and what they kept telling us was that, you know, we're so happy, but my neighbor is starting to get really upset and that their neighbor, like many times their neighbors had offered to come over to mow their lawn for free. Um, and they were like, no, no, this was part of a, a scientific study. You can't do it. But to me, I think what this is really getting at is that people aren't ready. So I think we can push it to that two week um, because it's kind of that balance and, you know, it's providing habitat, it's supporting bees, and it's also socially acceptable. And I think when we're thinking about ways of, of remanaging and reimagining our, our yards um, and these residential landscapes, the aesthetics has to be number one. And fortunately, there's also some ecological benefits as well. And so with that in mind, we designed um, some, some, uh, some signs that people can download for free um, to learn more about the project and to let their neighbors know that in fact, they're not just letting the yard go, but that it's um, some sort of intentionality um, so that it's letting their neighbors know that they're mowing and managing their yards for the bees. And I think this, this way of messaging and letting folks know that they too can be a part of this, um, this program and part of this movement to mowing less, I think can be a really powerful grassroots way, pun intended, um, to really trying to provide more habitat for bees. And so, 
With that, I just want to thank um, my co-authors and collaborators and the research um, and then all the, the field techs and lab techs that helped out and the homeowners who let us go and turn their yards into a, a field experiment. Um, and then also my communication staff and the US Forest Service. Um, here's my, my website. And if you, um, I'll be happy to put this into the chat later um, so that you too can go and, and download one of our, our lawn signs for free. You can print them out and then put them into your yard if you too also would like to be a, a lazy lawnmower. And just want to end it with um, a nice quote from Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. much. Oh, I'm hearing an echo. Um, that, let me see. It's a little new. Maybe I need to. Yes. yes. OK. Um, thank you so much. That was fascinating. And I love the yard sign. And I'm so glad that it's available to um, be downloaded for those of us who are already keeping, um, I loved your term, spontaneous plants growing in, um, in our yards. So we have a ton of questions um, that I will um, ask you as we go here. Um, let me open the chat. I'm having some technical difficulties. There we go. Okay. Um, so uh, there's so many. Where should I, I'll go back to the beginning here. What, so Lauren wants to know what native flowering, low growing plants or seeds can we plant in New Hampshire that you can still have a lawn like area if you don't want a lawn? Um, she says, my kids like to play and I want somewhere that is lush and greenish for them to play. But I, you know, she's also, I think, hoping to support bees. So here, here's the beauty of the study is that you don't have to plant anything. Um, in terms of um, some other low-lying plants, so I, I'm not a plant person per se, but I know that there's probably a lot of resources out there. But one thing though, I would like to mention, and I have, so this is kind of new research that I'm just embarking on now, um, is looking at this program from the University of Minnesota called this Bee Lawn Program. And it's, it's basically, it's a way of reseeding your, your lawns with, um, it has a lot of the, the grass species and clover and all of these other different types of bee rich, supposedly bee rich types of, of plant species. Um, but it's like, you manage it the same way you would manage a regular lawn. So you would mow it, you know, as infrequently as you would like. Um, but the nice thing is, is that there's more intentional. So there's the spontaneous and more intentional types of, of plantings in there. Um, so I know that the, this bee lawn program, like it's very specific in terms of the types of, of seeds that they have in that seed mix is very specific to Minnesota. Um, and so I don't know how, I don't know if it's been ad adopted to other parts of, of the United States yet. Um, but as I mentioned, I'm just starting up some new research in, in Minnesota um, next week. And so uh, hopefully, you know, maybe six years from now, um, I can come back and, and speak to you about these bee lawn programs. And hopefully by then, they have expanded to other parts of the United States. Excellent. Okay, so Deb says, I'm in a rural area and I mow to keep the forest from taking over. I mowed four or five times last year. I've got poison ivy and brambles, more resilient than other things that are growing in place of grass along with lots of moss. I do have some good stuff like wild strawberry, dandelion, and violets, but I feel like I need to do something to manage the open space, I guess, to keep the, the, the forest at bay and the poison ivy back. And she's wondering if you have suggestions. She thought maybe fertilizer or soil testing, or if there's any other thoughts you might have. I mean, so here, here's the other thing again, like the way I've kind of switched how I think about our yard. So I think parts, you know, having mowing part of your yard is, is totally fine. And so, I mean, we mow, we mow our lawn. Um, you know, we haven't done it yet because our lawnmower is broken. Um, but I think, you know, having certain areas for, you know, for, for playing, for, you know, just sitting outside, for keeping poison ivy away, keeping other plants that you don't want, I think mowing those is, is totally fine. Um, you know, I, that's again, what, what we're doing in our yard. Um, and so, you know, I, I think just continue, continue just mowing them down. Um, you know, the other thing that I've been doing, and I don't know which species it is, but I have this one plant that just keeps coming back every year and it, it just, it really kind of takes over. Um, and so every year I just tell myself, okay, I'm just going to like dig up like this one section. And then I hope, you know, hopefully by the next year they haven't come back, but there's always like a new, it's like, it's like whack-a-mole. 
Um, but you know, the other thing in terms of like where we live, um, you know, the, again, going back to the context matters. And so, you know, yes, if, you know, everybody, if everybody has five acres of lawn, like out in these rural areas, like that will be a problem. Um, but if you have, you know, like a small, like just what you need, and then the rest of your, your um, property is, is wild, um, I feel like there's, there's still like, there's enough out there. Um, so again, like reducing or not using any sorts of, of pesticides or herbicides, um, that would be great if you wanted to do more intentional types of plantings, like, you know, doing a, a pollinator garden. That could be another thing that you could do in some of these areas, like once you remove some of these different plants to go in and, you know, see if you can like put down cardboard for a while, try to kill whatever you don't want in there. Um, I think that could, could help. And, and then to go in immediately and, um, and replanting with some of these other, other species. But again, like, you know, there's a whole bunch of different options. Um, and so it, it depends on, again, your, your green thumb, whether or not you have one, if that's actually something that you enjoy doing. Um, and then also your, um, your wallet too, because sometimes, you know, like some of these plants, like it adds up, you know, you can get the really small ones and then you have to wait for five or 10 years for them to, you know, actually really take over your yard. Um, but yeah, so those are, I think, some of the different options. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is from Dennis. He says, we don't have full data, but today alone we collected a dozen ticks off the dog, us, and the side of the house. We have not mown the lawn since it is almost all early wildflowers and is four to six inches in height. We have ticks in the lawn and you're welcome to come collect. Uh, but nonetheless, if we mow now, many wildflowers will not bloom in the next months. Thoughts and advice to keep our pollinator paradise while decreasing tick exposure. Yeah, and so again, I'm, I'm guessing, Dennis, like, do you live in a, um, like, a, like, is there a lot of forest around? Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself, Dennis, and to, if you, if you like, because there was other people asking about forest that are to say in the chat. Um, uh, yes, we're in a forested area, uh, about uh, four acres, and there's forest all around us. Right. So, so again, like going back to that, you know, that picture that I showed in terms of like the context matters. So I'm, I'm guessing the dog is not just strictly staying right in the, in the lawn. Is the dog kind of exploring around? Like, so the, so there's a whole bunch of different things that might be, might be happening. So again, the dog, the dog stays in the grass and so do we. <laughs> So, and so we have them too, but so I think, so there are other ways that you can um, protect yourself from ticks. Um, but I, I think for a lot of times, again, like what we found in, in the suburbs that they weren't as much of a problem. Um, areas in, um, so I think like in um, upstate New York is where they've done some other research and also in Long Island. Um, again, that they haven't found ticks. So maybe New Hampshire is just, of this um you know area where there's just there's so many ticks and that you also i mean you know i know for me whenever i'm out in the woods like even if there's like an open area like because there's just the trees up up you know overhead um i still feel like no matter what i'm just i'm going to get ticks on me um so i i think it's it's i think it's just kind of part of of living in a rural landscape is dealing with ticks so um yeah, I'm sorry the the research probably it just it it definitely has its limitations as I mentioned um, in the the slide. Um, and so yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Have more or, or here's the other thing so there has been some some research that's um, actually shown you know having more diversity. So more more wildlife, so more mammals um, to just because I think what's going on is and probably going to get this wrong, but there's um, somebody at the Cary Institute um, who's done a lot of research on this, um, and then basically, basically found that when you have like, there's higher wildlife diversity, the tick population has actually, is actually decreased. And so I know there's like all this relationships with, with deer and white-footed mice, um, and also possums. And I think bobcats have a role to play as well. So I think it's, you know, again, when we see a mm. lot of, so I think that's also more of an indication of like kind of the broader landscape of what's happening. So an, um, a different question from David and Tricia. They're wondering about the impact on bees as the lawn was being mowed and whether you observed any of that or whether they just fly away. 
Yeah, this was also one of those parts where like, oh, I hate science sometimes because we'd go to these yards and there'd be tons of flowers and we're like, oh, we're gonna go and mow down all of the habitat. Um, I mean, for the most part, like, I can't say for certain. Um, I don't think we killed bees as we were mowing, um, but we were, yes, we were removing some of their habitat. And so one of the things that I think about, again, I, I think this study is, is probably a lot more applicable for more of the, the suburban types of residential neighborhoods than more kind of the rural types of landscape. Um, but one of the things to realize is that for, you know, bees fly. And so, you know, as long as, like, if you think about, you know, a neighborhood, and so if, say neighbor one they mow on monday and then neighbor two they mow on wednesday and then neighbor three mows on friday so that there's still flowers around the bees can kind of track where the flowers are and then just kind of come back you know once those flowers in, in yard a have regrown and been able to um to try to track with with the growth of the flowers um but in terms of you know like again a lot of these bees are nesting in the ground um and so there might there might be some disturbance in terms of the the nesting ecology of bees um that's a huge black box so we you know a lot of bee research and pollination research really focuses on on the food resources we know so much less almost nothing about their breeding behavior about where they're nesting um in terms of like the different types like specific conditions what types of, like we have an idea about the sort of types of soil but to be able to go and find their nests and track that i think that's a, a really important component and i think you know maybe we're not having direct mortality every time we mow but over time the compaction might be having some um some influence on the um on the the populations that's really interesting to think about. Um, Kathleen's wondering, going back to ticks, everyone's favorite. Um, do you know if areas heavily populated with songbirds have fewer ticks? Have you read anything about? Um, I don't know if there's, let's see. I know that there's a relationship with um, multiflora rose and ticks. Um, and, oh gosh, let me, I hope I'm going to get it get it right for some reason i feel like with multiflora when there's a lot of multiflora rows i think there's less leaf litter and so there's actually less ticks in in forest patches and this is some research in um in delaware um and so and then i know that there's a relationship though with multiflora rows like the increased abundance of multiflora rows um has lower um i think it was wood thrush and catbird so they're there's, a, I think, a complicated relationship, but I don't know um, in terms of that relationship. I'm, I'm wondering, are you thinking that in terms of like, if there's more birds around, birds are eating ticks and like in terms of that relationship? Yes. Yeah, I don't, yes. um, yeah, ticks, ticks are, they're also really hard to find. Like, I mean, so we think that they're like, they're, you know, they find us, um, but in terms of like from a, from a, a songbird's perspective, like, being able to go and in, into the ground and find ticks, like they're they're not very easy. And so, for a lot of insectivorous birds, they're focusing on like a lot more like these um, flying insects, these aerial insects, um, or also like larger insects. They're a bit more meteor, like a lot of beetles and um, grubs and, and different types of species like that. So, I'm not familiar. Again, like going back to you know looking at the the diet of birds, I don't know if there's too much relationship between um, birds eating ticks. And and um, and so therefore, I, I don't think that there would be a relationship, but I, I'm not sure of any studies about it. Yeah, okay, think, thank you. Sure. There seems to be more around mammals. And also I've seen some around snakes who are eating small mammals, that, that, that there's a, re a relationship there. Uh, Okay, I think we have reached our time. So um, I wanna thank you, Susanna, for this really um, wonderful research and for sharing it with us so generously. And I wanna thank everyone else um, for joining us and hope that you will join us again next week for firefly, next couple of weeks for fireflies to kind of wrap up our pollinator um, talk. So thanks all and thanks, Susanna, Dr. Lerman. And um, we hope to see you all soon.